So I'd like to now um, introduce our presenter, um, Dr. Zhao Ning Lu. And she's a reader in modern Chinese uh, literature and culture. And she's got a really interesting session. I'm actually really interested to see this today as well. Um, Women and Chinese Revolution on Screen. So I will now hand over to Dr. Liu. Thank you, Tanya, for your introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone here virtually. So I'm going to share my screen first. This is to give you a taste of our online teaching. Uh, this is what I have been doing this whole academic year. And so the topic today is women and the Chinese revolution on screen. I'd like to use this opportunity, this topic to address three important questions. The first one, I, sorry, I gave you uh, this code. Uh, you may be very familiar with Lenin's code of all the arts for us, the most important is cinema. Um, so this code just to highlight the importance of cinema, this relatively new media in the 20th century, especially in the mid of the 20th century to, uh, to the shaping of ideology, to the shaping of the, the, the public consciousness, the collective consciousness. Second, I offer this book title, and some of you may also be very familiar. Uh, it is by Benedict Anderson. Imagine communities, reflections on their origin and spread of nationalism. Um, Anderson has this famous saying, nationalism is really, you know, it's, a, it's imagined uh, because we don't know each other. The nation is so big and uh, it's impossible to have, you know, the close relationship to each other. So what we can imagine is through print media, newspapers, and or maybe we can add all different kinds of media, including cinema. So uh, this session is really to, to showcase how cinema was employed by the Chinese Communist Party to create a certain collective memory um, and a collective you know, identity. And the last one, I think it's, which is related to today's topic is the women's question and the nationalism. And the women's question was always important to, uh, to the forging of Chinese nationalism. Women's suffering has been regarded as the symptom of the nation's suffering. To rescue women is to found a solution to modernize the nation. Okay, so I'm going to uh, use a very classic Chinese revolutionary film, The Red Detachment of Women, in order to address all these three questions. Okay. First, I'd like to give you an overview of uh, the, the new Chinese cinema. Uh, it is called the new Chinese cinema because this was a new cinema created after the founding of the People's Republic of China. So we had this transition from the so-called the old China before 1949 to the new China, which is communist China after 1949. And then under the governance of Chinese Communist Party, there was a, a massive restructuring of film industry. Um, so from, from 1949 to 1952, privately owned film studios were gradually nationalized and became part of the state studios. And then and the uh, bureaucratic institutions such as the Bureau of a Film, the Film Bureau was established. And that bureau was established under the Ministry of Culture. It oversaw you know, the, um, the pre-production inspection and it instituted certain and, and the film production related regulations, et cetera. And then we saw uh, there was a, like a wide sweeping changes in film production, exhibition, distribution, right? Or under a centrally planned economy. Um, so if I give you a few more specific examples, for instance, with regard to film production, the, the key issue would be what kind of a new films should we create for the masses? And now, according to the Communist Party at the time, the masses included the workers, soldiers, and peasants. 
And so the idea is we do we did not wish to make film for the bourgeoisie, right? For the like the uh, the leisure class, we should make films for the majority of the people. At the time, the majority of people were the so-called working class or the proletarians. So what kind of new films do we need? Uh, they created new screen characters instead of showing. The, 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 the gentlemen's, the, miss, the madams, misses in middle class, they wanted to project new screen images such as the poor peasants and the soldiers, etc. New subject matters. So this is quite interesting because normally we're familiar with film genre. A film genre is a way to categorize different type of films. Well, you should be very familiar with action films, romance, etc. Um, but in the socialist China, um, the films were not categorized in accordance with genre. Instead, they were categorized according to the subject matters. For instance, um, the film studio every year would receive a quota, the production quota. Say this studio said, this year you need to produce eight films uh, with rural subject matters about the countryside, right? About uh, land reform, for example, collective agriculture, etc. And then this film studio, you need to produce two industrial themed subject matters. Um, so you can demonstrate um, how new socialist workers work in uh, to build the socialism in this country. And of course, there are more entertaining film, uh, uh, films with new subject matters. For example, here I have a, a DVD cover. Um, so the title is Women Basketball Player Number Five. So it's a, it deals with a contemporary subject matter sports, sports film. And here's another example, Five Golden Flowers. Simply by the images, you can tell it is a film about ethnic minorities. And normally those films showing, uh, normally those films show uh, happy, um, singing and dancing ethnic minorities, but then they were also a part of the bigger socialist collective. And those films also show them how they uh, show how they participated in uh, socialist construction. Okay, and uh, so now if we understand there was strong need to create a new cinema in all sectors, in all the process of film production, exhibition, distribution, um, and we also need to understand uh, the new images, new narratives, new aesthetics. And uh, all those together helped uh, to articulate the socialist ideology, or you can say the dominant ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, they also helped to shape national identity. So this is a, a very interesting thing because normally we would think a film represents or reflect reality, but to be very careful here for Chinese socialist film, they want to make something, right? So they actually project what needs to be, what should be, okay? And so you can see film has this active role in, uh, to play in building uh, socialist imaginary, in, in reforming the people. Okay, so um, here I'd like to introduce a little bit the overarching guidelines for Chinese socialist production from the year 1949 to 1976. Uh, so this is the, this period is so-called a high socialism. Okay, and um, so the, the most influential piece of writing is by Mao Zedong, um, talks at the Yang'an Forum of Literature and Arts. He delivered, actually this piece was originally a talk, right? He delivered two talks at the Yang'an Forum on literature and arts in, um, in the year 1942. At the time, China was engaged in the second Sino-Japanese war. So bear this in mind, it was uh, during the wartime he delivered this speech. And uh, he, uh, he proposed there are two criteria for evaluating artwork the political one and the artistic one. And uh, he, state, he states clearly uh, the political criteria has to come first. The artistic criterion comes second. And now you will see the art somehow is, subjug uh, is uh, subjugated to the politics. But uh, Mao also pointed out 
in order to serve the, the our you know communist cause, the, the revolutionary cause, at the time was anti, uh, was fighting against Japanese. We need to make our arts more accessible. So here are two questions. One is how to popularize our art, and the second is how to raise the standards of our artwork. And uh, he, uh, he proposed a, a few methods and strategies. For instance, he mentioned the cultural workers. Uh, cultural workers uh, means uh, refer to you know writers, artists, singers, dancers, etc. They are all called cultural workers at the time. Uh, he said a cultural worker should go to the countryside and live with the peasants uh, and really to, to learn from the experiences and draw ex inspirations from the, from the masses. Uh, you should use, make use of the indigenous Chinese art, for example, folk songs, folk art, etc. Then you tell a revolutionary story, the peasants would understand. Okay, so in summary, the key point of this uh, talk, this piece, talks at Yang'an Forum on Literature Art. Yes, art and the literature must serve the masses. It is for the masses, by the masses, and about the masses, right? And he also encouraged the, the peasants to make, to make their own artwork. Uh, for example, you can rewrite folk songs into a revolutionary song, etc. cetera. And uh, uh, so this, this talk, those two talks had a great, implications uh, on the, the cultural production during the early years of socialist China. Uh, it helped to create the so-called mass culture because all cultural works are dedicated to the masses and a focus on the representation of their lives and the struggle. Okay, so now we understand the, the guiding principle of creating art and uh, literature, including cinema. So if I may go to the next slide. So women in socialist China, policies and discourses. When it comes to women, as I mentioned earlier, women's question is always related to the nation. Um, and um, of course, uh, even before the official founding of the PRC, People's Republic China, uh, there was this uh, uh, common program. So this is a de facto first constitution of the PRC common program of the Chinese People's Political Cons uh, Consultative Conference. It is a de facto constitution. Article six states, women should enjoy equal rights with men in, uh, in political, economic, cultural, educational, and social life, etc. And maybe more commonly, you know, a few slogans are uh, widely have been widely uh, circulated and disseminated. For instance, from the Maoist era, from the Mao era, men and the women are equal. Women hold up half, half sky. In terms of iconography of women, you will see a drastic change. So this is a commercial poster in the 1930s. And you will see, uh, we are very familiar with this type of image, right? You, you use women to advertise a certain commodity, merchandise. Here is this beautifully dressed Chinese lady and holding a glass of a Coca-Cola. Um, but now if we uh, switch to the 1950s, 60s, this image of women becomes, uh, uh, became very prevalent. Uh, so the, the, the caption says, we are proud for participating in our nation's industrialization. So you have woman workers. Uh, actually this woman worker is in a heavy industry. Okay, so now, uh, this is a general change uh, in the in discourses and in uh, in policy. Now I'll give you this uh, wonderful example of the red detachment of women. So this woman, this this film was produced in 1961. I need to switch my next slide. Okay, uh, the film has since become one of the red classics. Uh, the one of the, the classical revolutionary films. Um, it won the 100 Flowers Awards for Best Film, Best Director, Best Actress, and Best Supporting Actor in 1962. The 100 the Flowers Awards is the most important film award in China during the socialist era. Uh, if we look at the subject matter, right, it is a revolutionary history film. Um, 
if I may give you a little bit of synopsis of the film, um, I would say, um, so this is a film about a revolutionary story of a company of a female soldiers set up by the Communist Party on the island of Hainan. Uh, so Hainan is really on the southern tip of China. If you look at the map, Hainan Island is a small island. Uh, it's very close to Canton province, but it's on the southern tip. And you, you may think about the implication of setting the story there. Uh, it could mean, you know, the communist revolution was so powerful, it even reaches, uh, reached the farthest tip of the nation, right? Um, so the story is set in 1930. That was before the founding of the PRC. So this film is really retracing the communist revolutionary history. Okay. So it was set in Hainan Island and off the south coast of China in the 1930s. Uh, especially the film's narrative centers on Chonghua, this, this woman, uh, this, and she is initially a slave girl held captive by an evil feudal landlord. Nan Ba Tian, I, even just looking at his face, you can guess it's a typical depiction of a villain. And then later on, under the guidance of this communist party, at the time he is uh, he's disguised as a rich merchant from Singapore, from Southeast Asia. And so with his help, Chunghua goes to the communist revolutionary base and join the Red Detachment of uh, the Red Detachment of Women and join a female, uh, join the, uh, the communist army. So this is a very common story. Uh, it is very um, typical of uh, revolutionary historical stories at the time. That means you narrate the history, revolutionary history, through an individual's coming to consciousness, through an individual's, uh, individual's growth. Okay, let's see. So I'm going to show you, okay. And, uh, and uh, you, you may wonder why the story of history has to be narrated through the lens of a woman, right? And uh, uh, somehow we can detect the continuities between pre-1949 era and the post-1949 era, uh, because turning the sufferings of victimized women into a visceral ac accusation of a corrupted society was very common. It was, com it was used in 1930s leftist film, and this tradition continued into the socialist era. Okay, so you have this uh, plight of women, right? And then uh, I also mentioned the film combines revolutionary history with the coming to the consciousness of a single representative, often female characters. So let's take a look. Uh, I want to show you a few clips of how this film represents women. So, so the first clip we will see Chonghua when she was still a slave girl held captive. Uh, I need to stop sharing. I'm going to show you my YouTube video. You can actually find this film on YouTube with English subtitle. So I'm going to play this clip. And obviously, you see the whole thing is staged in the uh, in in a water uh, in a water prison uh, in the landlord's house. I look at the lighting, right? It is not a sunny, bright setting. It is very dark, and to, uh, so this kind of lighting really emphasizes the imprisonment of women. And how about the representation of women? Women here is not sexualized. Women here is not a fetishized, but women here, we have the image of a suffering woman. She is beaten yeah, by the landlord's henchman. And here we also see um, implicitly here, we have this intersection between us because this is a, a slave girl, right? So she suffers at the hand of the, the landlord. 
，还跑吗？贱丫头，臭奴才，打，看不住就跑。You can also sense her personality. She's a very rebellious girl, and she wanted to escape. She's going to try again, again. At this point, actually, she has already escaped once, and she was captured, recaptured. But she said, "I'm going to run away again." Okay, and I'm going to show you the second clip. Interestingly,、uh, the film also portrays another woman.、Oh, I'm going to show you. So at least more points of the story, and、um, Chunghua, so this protagonist, under the guidance of the、uh, the Communist Party member, she wants she is on her way to the revolutionary base, right? We pause here.、Uh, we pause here. So you will see this is an, another suffering woman, right? She disguised herself as a man, and here the film accused the the, the feudal, the old feudal practice of the arranged marriage. Notice this woman, right?、Uh, so this this segment address her frustrated marriage. She was arranged to marry this man, but actually before the marriage, the man died already. So therefore, you will see this wooden log. Right, so、uh, ridiculously, she had to marry this、uh, wooden, you know,、uh, wooden log. Okay,、um, okay. So I'm going to show you the last clip you will see. And so these two women, they form a kind of a bondage. Of, uh, they form a very strong bond because they both suffered. 
uh, under the feudal society. And they both said, oh, we're going to, I'm on my way to the Soviet district. district. Soviet district here uh, just refers to the Chinese communist revolutionary base. So the last, quickly, the last clip you will see now, they're going to the um, base. So maybe I can fast forward a tiny bit. And here, if you can notice, this is an open space, right? And the lighting is bright. Um, in contrast to the formal domestic space, domestic space appear to be suffocating. Um, and here, the two women, they arrive at the communist revolutionary base. They want to join the women soldiers. And I need to quickly fast forward a tiny bit, tiny bit. So here's a moment you will see, in contrast to the normal, the ordinary folks, the soldiers are disciplined, right? And uh, so in the entire film, later on, we'll show you how the slave girl gradually grows into a resolute communist soldier. Uh, here is kind of interesting because the, they are applying to join the army and then they need to check their class background, right? And they don't know whether they're qualified. So they are, just, they are only, they use their very common language to say, uh, I don't have land. And uh, the, the female soldiers, of course, they use a more like a politically led in the world or more sophisticated words, proletarian um, to, to welcome them. So, okay, I have to pause here and come back to my slides. This is just to give you a little taste of the film. And then if I can come back to my slide and give you a quick conclusion. Okay, uh, so in this film, we will see how the melodrama, the normally we, we're talking about the family melodrama, but in this film is a revolutionary melodrama. So revolutionary melodrama has been utilized as a very important form to, to narrate uh, revolutionary history. Uh, in melodrama, you know, the uh, traditional melodrama, we see polarization of good and evil. It's very easy to, uh, for you to identify the good guy and the bad guy. It has clear moral message. And uh, then you also have like a heightened emotion, emotional access, etc. And often melodrama feature the sufferings of the victims. And there is a strong demand for the redemption of their sufferings. And the domestic space is very important, um, et cetera. But here in this film, we will see uh, melodrama transforms into revolutionary melodrama. The suffocating domestic interior is often associated, uh, that, that was often associated with family melodrama is displayed only to be discarded and us supplanted by a different form of kingship, right? Because uh, so now the kingship is based on your class solidarity, your common suffering instead of your blood lineage. And uh, uh, so overall the film helps to legitimize the cause of communist revolution. And the last one I'm, I'd like to say, um, so there's many different versions of this film because then the film also was adapted into a ballet in, 19, in 1970s uh, when Pre President Nixon 
visited China in 1972. They actually watched this uh, ballet on stage. Uh, and then the, the ballet was restaged in 2015 Lincoln Center Festival. So this explains why it has been a classic. Um, so lastly, I uh, provide a few links for you. And uh, then I hope you have get a little bit of ideas about the Chinese history and the film. Um, by the way, we also have a social media presence. If you can find us uh, on Facebook and Instagram, we have a SOAS China and Asia on Facebook page. We have a SOAS East Asia on Instagram. Um, thank you very much. And now I welcome your questions. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. Um, I really um, hadn't heard a lot of that background, so I enjoyed it just to find out what some of our academics across SOAS teach. There's a lot of rich content. Um, I see there's a question um, in the Q&A panel for you, Dr. Liu. Um, I'll just read it out for you if you wouldn't mind answering. So how did this portrayal of China as a suffering woman who has been saved through communism interact with Mao's cult of personality? motherland and the father. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, it's a very big question, the cult of Mao. Uh, please also notice the historical period. Um, so here, the most revolutionary films were actually produced be before 1966. You know, 1966 is the year when the Cultural Revolution erupted. So the cult of Mao really came after that period. So normally we divide the socialist era, 1949 to 1976, into two sub periods. The first one is the first 17 years, and the second one is the 10 years, you know, the, the 10 years catastrophe, it's the Cultural Revolution. And the Mao's personality cult uh, reached the climax during the Cultural Revolution. Okay, uh, that's one way to address your question. And of course, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, we have uh, we had a different forms of cultural practices instead of watching film. In fact, the film production was halted. Well, it, was not, it was not possible to make a lot of films up to 1972. Uh, instead of watching films, um, people, would, uh, uh, people recited Mao's works, the quotations, you know, the quotations of the, the, the red books, right? The, the, the Mao's quotation, people were, dance the royalty dance and uh, recite the, the poems, uh, recite the quotations and the other different forms of mass culture. Yeah, but it's quite interesting because the female figure, right? Uh, even in, within this film, you will see the woman is always the one who needs to be educated uh, because the party member, the, the representative is the man. Uh, within the, the film, the man actually dies first as a martyr. So the film centers on Chunghua's personal growth, but nevertheless, she is always the one who needs to be rescued, needs to be educated. So it's really a story, you know, that uh, tells the history about nations through the suffering of women and a woman's growth. Great, okay, we've got a couple of other really interesting questions coming in. So George has asked, is there any evidence of these values progressing into the, um, ever rising new Chinese cinema sector, which is expected to rival Hollywood? Uh, okay, uh, that's very good question. So we, we do talk a lot about uh, um, Chinese soft power. How does cinema and other media play a role in building up Chinese soft power? And the news, new, uh, we have the so-called new um, men melody film. So like a mainstream film, but a men melody film that those are the films propagate the, the current ideology. And those films, interestingly, they do not center on women. They center on men, the masculinity of men. Uh, you may be familiar with the, the film Wolf Warrior 2, right? It's uh, really uh, to show this soldier, the lone hero, uh, the, he is a formal uh, PLA soldier, uh, like a People's Liberation Army soldier. Uh, he was discharged from the army. He was sent to the, somehow he went to Af Africa to rescue um, the Chinese diasporas in a war-torn zone. And of course, he was backed by Chinese Navy, right? And so the current film really showed the masculinity. So it's a very, very different. Um, yeah, maybe I can take a few more. 
Okay. Yeah, we've got about six or seven minutes left and a few more questions have come in. So um, Eleanor has asked, were women considered equals in a time when so many women around the world were considered inferior because Mao needed more supporters for his revolution? Yes, yeah. Uh, so this is another important issue about uh, you know feminism because the the emancipation of Chinese women was part and parcel of Chinese revolutionary uh, uh, Chinese communist revolution. So we we the form of Chinese feminism is very different from the Western feminism. Uh, we often use the the phrase state feminism to describe the Chinese feminist. Uh, liberation, no, the women's liberation. There was no self-conscious feminist movement in the PRC. And uh, um, please also note, um, in the Mao era, era, they emphasized the equality of men and women to such an extreme that the women's sexuality, femininity was erased. Okay, so they the women were pushed to such an extreme to go to the field to uh, to do the hard work immediately after childbirth. Because there are many other uh, episodes, incident, uh, interesting stories. But then, so you we have to be very careful about that kind of ideology, right? Um, yeah, because you are right. Women were much needed as a a mainstay of the laboring force. We need to emancipate women also to have more power in the working force, yeah. That's great, so we've got two more questions I think we have time to answer. And the first one's um, a bit of a kind of a personal feeling for you, this is an interesting one. So um, Usario is asking, do you only teach film and literature? And if not, what's your favorite part of the course to teach? Uh, I mainly teach Chinese film and the literature and, and this year we actually, uh, started a new module, I taught contemporary Chinese society. Uh, this is a, a, a survey course to many key questions, issues in contemporary Chinese uh, society. For instance, migration, um, the, especially women's migration. We also talk about the environmental uh, issues uh, using the film and other sources to address. Uh, I've also taught about the internet censorship in this module. So this is a really new module. And my colleagues uh, in China section um, uh, teaches China in 10 words and um, East Asian imperialism, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, uh, because I, my specialization is Chinese cinema. So I, I do quite enjoy we, uh, to teach film modules. Uh, please also notice at the SOAS, we not only teach films from men in China, we also have uh, this um, entire module called a uh, uh, new cinema, uh, uh, new Taiwan cinema and beyond. And I think this is a very unique module uh, across Europe. You would probably not find any other institution that devote a whole term teaching Taiwan cinema. So Benjamin's asking, um, was the shift in portrayal of women in posters from traditional dress, advertising Coca-Cola to heavy industry, was that reflected in the population? In other words, did women do more heavy industry jobs after 1949 than they did before? Yes, definitely. And um, uh, it was um, encouraged. You know, in, in Chinese renminbi, Chinese currency at like the cash, right? You see the icon, female tractor, uh, tractor driver. That's real because women were really uh, encouraged like to be a pirate pilots, you know, flying the airplane and be engineer. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. And um, there were many female film filmmakers as well. So that's very different from the Western, maybe British situation uh, because a female, uh, the women, they received this institutional support. They were sent to film schools. And then after graduation, state assigned, assigned them work. There was no free market. You, you couldn't look for a job by yourself. The state assigned you, you go to that film studio, you become director. Yeah, but uh, so this is like, uh, ironically, that also creates a group of fem uh, female filmmakers. Great. Um, Iris has a question that I wanted to ask. Are these films that you showed here today, are these films still popular in China today? Um, I don't think they were popular among young people. Uh, because, you know, people become very uh, wary, like they're tired of those old propagandist discourses. 
And often the ballet are still staged for national events and um, it be, it, they become part of the classical repertoire of the ballet. But the young people, I, I think they are very similar to here for uh, anybody here. They are into the YouTube, not, not YouTube, but the Chinese version of TikTok or other things. They watch, a, they consume a lot of media content. Right. <laughs> right, so this is our last question before we have to wrap up. Charles is asking, did Mao get inspiration from the political philosophy of Chinese legalism to create this animosity between communism and the feudal practices? Oh, this is a very big question. I'm afraid I couldn't answer this very well because I am not trained in Chinese philosophy. And I, uh, what I can say, uh, Mao, he is deeply immersed in Chinese classics, you know, like on his bed, like on his bed, there's a bookshop, like he's just a wooden plank on top. He put many, many books. He loved to read Chinese classic novels. And um, yeah, so maybe it plays a, plays a role, definitely. That's great. Well, um, I see we're joined by Nena, our student um, ambassador. So Nena, and um, I should have introduced Dr. Alan Cummings, our associate head of department as well. So I might just allow you both to, to wrap up with any final comments or thoughts or Nena, if you'd like to talk a little bit about your experience as a student at SOAS. Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Nena and I'm fourth year um, Ch BA Chinese student. Um, so this is my final year, so I've had, you know, the full experience. I would say for me, learning Chinese at SOAS has been, um, has been great. Um, I've learned so much. There's so many interesting modules to do here at SOAS that maybe, uh, that are quite specific to SOAS and maybe you wouldn't find elsewhere, which was definitely a reason for me picking uh, to study at SOAS. And yeah, it's really nice to meet you all. And if any of you have any questions, I'm just going to put in the, um, student ambassador's email where you can send any questions you have, any comments or anything. And yeah, nice to meet you all. Uh, hi, my name's Alan Cummings. I'm the, as well as being associate head of the department, I'm also the admissions tutor. Uh, so I'm a person who gets to look at lots of your um, applications. Uh, so if you do have any, any questions which are you know more about the structure of the degree or the kind of modules we're offering. Uh, we have lots of information on the website, but you can also write uh, directly to me as well. And I'm happy to you know to answer any of those questions you have about you know qualifications you have and you know what the courses are like or any of that sort of stuff. Um, my email is it's also in the chat as well, but it's ac50 uh, at soas.ac.uk. Uh, and I'd be delighted to hear from you. But thank you all for, for, for coming and thank you to uh, Xiaoning for giving us such a, a fantastic talk. Thank you all for being here. And this is the second day of a Lunar Chinese New Year. So still I can say Xin Yan Kuai Le. That's a wonderful way to end. Thank you, Dr. Liu. So Happy New Year to everyone, uh, Year of the Ox. And we will be circulating the recordings of this with some of the questions and the contact details. So thank you for the really thoughtful questions and really engaging with this, really appreciate that. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from all of you in the coming months. So thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>